So, these are the specific emotions, anguish or anxiety, forlornness, and despair. And very quickly, I'm just going to go over them just so that we have an idea of what they mean um, to us. Um, there's this passage, uh, the first way that um, Sartre winds up defining anguish or anxiety is this way, on page 18. First, what's it meant by anguish? Existentialists say at once that man is anguish. What that means is this, a man who involves himself and who realizes that he is not only the person he chooses to be, but also a lawmaker who is, at the same time, choosing all of mankind as well as himself, cannot help escape a feeling of total and deep responsibility. Of course, there are many people who are not anxious, but we claim that they are hiding their anxiety, that they are fleeing from it. Now, effectively, and it's the word lawmaker, where is it, right there, that should send sort of an alarm bell off on you right here, because we've seen a position somewhat like this in the past in Immanuel Kant, right? With regard to that transition between the first and the second formulation of the categorical imperative, you've seen this. I mean, uh, for Kant, because we had this particular kind of freedom, this rational autonomy, this ability to uh, limit our desires and, and, and act in terms of the formulations of the categorical imperative, every time we come to a judgment as a result of these formulations of the categorical imperative, we are effectively legislating universal moral law. It's part of partially a trick of words, right? but it's also partially sort of the reality of the situation. When we make a judgment like that, we're not just holding ourselves to our own individual or particular standard, but rather we are legislating for all of mankind. We are saying with each and every one of our actions, this is what any rational calculative being should come to the same conclusion that this is correct. Right? So it's kind of on the same page here, but he's, 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 he's not having this arise as, as a result of a calculation filtered through an ethical system. Right? What Sartre is pointing out is that we are absolutely nothing until we choose and until we act. We only become something as a result of these choices and actions which we are incredibly, inherently, deeply responsible for. And since we are defining humanity through our choices, what it means to be human is a reflection of these choices and actions of our own. You see, this isn't some sort of rational autonomy that Sartre is talking about. The technical term is an ontological condition. Our freedom is an ontological condition. Right? It, it is effectively what we are, which is not a definition. Right? In fact, it is the lack of a definition right, that defines us. That's our uniquely human position that we are not defined. When we choose an act, we define ourselves. And if this is the case, effectively in choosing ourselves, what we are doing is stating that all of humanity should guide itself by our actions. He continues over on page 20. <clears throat> after using Abraham as an example. Now, I'm not singling out as Abraham, right? And yet, at every moment, I'm obliged to perform exemplary acts. Each and every one of us are obliged to perform exemplary acts. For every man, and uh, everything happens as if all mankind has uh, had its eyes fixed on him and were guiding itself by what he does. And every man ought to say to himself, am I really the kind of man who has the right to act in such a way that humanity might guide itself by my actions. And if he does not say them, that to himself, he's masking his anguish. Right? Now, 
yeah, I don't know how to get this across to you, but uh, to a certain extent, this isn't just being confronted with the consequences of your action. An example of that might be like, for example, I don't know, when I'm alone with my children. I'm alone with my children and the buck stops with me. All right. Whatever happens to these children or with regard to these children is my responsibility and really to a certain extent I fear the consequences of my choices and actions and really my inactions and my inattention as well. If I don't pay attention and my daughter sticks her tongue in the light socket and electrocutes herself, that's on me. All right? That's not, that's not what Sartre is talking about here. All right? This kind of anguish or anxiety should be what we experience every time we make any sort of cha choice or action, even if nobody's looking, right? Even if nobody notices the consequences, right? That anxiety is what we feel. Here's an example. You ever litter, right? And look around to make sure nobody is watching, right? That's anxiety. That's anxiety. Right? You are feeling anxious because you are doing something that you are responsible for. Right? And you realize that if other people guide by your actions, right, take your example, that the, the, the consequences won't be good and that's not something you will to be as a definition for human action. Right? This is not what you wish humanity to stand for. If this insight were to gain hold of you, right, and really sort of frame the way that you choose and live your life, think of the kind of deep responsibility that you would feel. Each and every one of your choices having to stand as sort of a guide, a signpost for all of humanity. Mm -hmm. Now, effectively, this is the cornerstone of Sartre's ethics. It's not on the basis of reason that we're calculating or anything along those lines. You are free, you're responsible, and you with your actions are defining what it means to be human, not just for yourself, but for everybody else. Mm -hmm. So that human beings slaughter each other as a matter of course that reflects on each and every one of us that we lie that we steal that we cheat that we treat one another as though we are things rather than people that is something that we all have to live with as a feature of humanity and our condition now the goal becomes for the existentialist to live in a way that you would will all of humanity to live. Well, where do we turn for that, right? Where do we turn for a best practices guide or uh, some sort of a rule book or it, you can't somebody come down a mountain with some tablets or something along those lines. Now, here's the funny thing. Uh, the existentialist will point out to you that, you know, no, we are forlorn. Right? What this means is that effectively we have nowhere to turn for legitimacy or guidance. Right? Now, you might say, well, it's we have lots of places to turn. What about Kant? What about Mill? What about Aristotle? What about Plato? What about Socrates? What about the Bible? What about Dale Carnegie? What about uh, the law? What about, you know, grandma and grandpa? What about our preacher? What about our Sunday school teacher? What about our school teachers? What about all of these rules that are set up for us to follow? Isn't it enough to just follow? No. Here's the funny thing. If God itself appeared in a white poof of smoke, right? This is, this is the depth of the existentialism, existentialist position. If God itself appeared in a white poof of smoke, I am God, you should live your life according to these principles. The existentialist points out that we still have a lot of ethical work to do even before we act on the basis of those principles. One, there's this white poof of smoke. We have to 
choose, that is, interpret, that this being is in fact God, and not maybe a result of some bad food that we ate, or a hallucinogenic drug, or something that that's in the vents in the air supply, or part of a dream, or something along those lines. We first have to choose to believe that this being is God. Secondly, we have to choose to listen to this being who we've chosen, if we've chosen, to believe that this being is God and live according to these principles. So we, we have to choose to listen to this being. Third, we have to choose how to interpret the principles in which this being wants us to live our lives. Right? So we have to choose to how to interpret these principles, and then we have to apply these principles to a specific concrete real situation in order to live our lives and have that have any meaning or impact whatsoever. All right? So effectively, look at all the choices we had to make, even if God itself told us to act in a particular way. We would have to choose one, that's God. Two, we're going to listen to this being, that's God. Three, well, how do we interpret the way that this being, who we've chosen to believe is God and chosen to actually listen to and behave in this manner, how do we interpret these principles? And then we have to interpret the principles further to make them applicable to action. Right? in each and every instance and case. Right? So, effectively, there's no wiggling out of it. It's on us. It's on us. There is nowhere even, well, God says that we should, well, first off, you've chosen to believe in God. Secondly, you've chosen to listen to this being you've chosen to believe is God. Right? And third, you've interpreted that thing in general, Right? to fit with your interpretation of this God. And then finally, you've interpreted that this and this particular sort of instance is what that general stream of choices means. And you have to do that in each and every instance for the whole of your life. There's no turning away from our, res from our responsibility. So this is what Sartre means by forlornness. When we speak of forlornness, this is page 21, right? a term Heidegger was fond of, we mean only that God does not exist and we have to face all of the consequences of this. That's a little strong. Sartre is an unabashed atheist. Right? The more general existentialist point is that either God exists or God doesn't exist. If God exists, then it all has to, we're in exactly the same situation if there was no God. We have to choose, we have to act, we have to interpret, we have to give our lives meaning ourselves. So one way or the other, it is on us. We're free and absolutely responsible. So it continues, the existentialist is strongly opposed to a certain kind of secular ethics that would like to abolish God with the least possible expense. Right? And then he gives an example of these, 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 these French theorists in 1880 who tried to do this. Well, you can't really do that. Right? So over in 22 he continues, right, quoting Dostoyevsky, if God, God didn't exist, everything would be possible. Everything would be permitted. Indeed, Sir claims everything is permissible if God does not exist, and as a result, man is forlorn, because neither within him nor without does he find anything to cling to. He, he can't start making excuses for himself. If existence really does precede essence, there's no explaining things away by reference to a fixed idea or given human nature. In other words, there's no determinism. Man is free, man is freedom. On the other hand, if God does not exist, we find no values or commands to turn to which legitimize our conduct. So, in the bright realm of values, we have no excuse behind us, nor justification before us. We are alone with no excuses. This is the idea that I shall try to convey when I say that man is condemned to be free, because uh, condemned because he did not create himself yet in other respects, is free. 
because once thrown into the world, he's responsible for everything he does. The existentialist does not believe in the power of passion. He will never agree to the, 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 that a sweeping passion is ravaging a, a ravaging torrent, which fi, uh, 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 which fatality leads man, uh, fatally leads man to certain acts, and is therefore an excuse. He thinks that man is responsible for his passion. So effectively, what Sartre is arguing here is that we are always and everywhere in every single case the source of legitimacy for our actions. There's no rule book, there's no culture, there's no you know, divine being, there is no authority figure that can tell us what to do and take that total and deep responsibility away from us. We have to do it on our own. And what's more, we are condemned to choose and act and create this meaning and legitimacy for ourselves in each and every case by ourselves. We're condemned to do it. There's no way around it. Even if we say, well, I'm just doing what I'm told. We've already done a lot of that work. If the existentialist is right, it's hard to say they're not, right? Because we're thrown into a world and we, if we're free, we're defining ourselves and responsible for ourselves in this world in each and every case. Right? If they're right, effectively the source of meaning is us. The source of legitimacy is us. And the, 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 the person who's responsible, us. Here's a funny example. I knew these guys. Uh, they were, they were uh, contracting instructors, but a stout contract. Um, after having finished their PhDs, they, they got these good at limited term appointments um, at a school that I was studying at. Both of them felt owed. Both of them felt as though they had done all of the right things, made all of the right moves, and uh, both of them felt like there was some sort of system that had offered their actions and their careers and their choices a form of legitimacy. If I do the X, Y, and Z, then the result should be A, B, and C. Uh, well, these systems that offered their careers legitimacy were interpreted by them in a real meaning. The rules can change in the blink of an eye. Uh, so, effectively, what they were doing is trying to define themselves on the basis of an external rule book that they realized, you know, made no sense. Right? They were alone with their choices. The buck stopped with them. Right? Nice guys, both of them. One of them figured it out, the other one uh, less so. Right? But nonetheless, we are forlorn. Right? There's no owner's manual to human life. There's, there's no operating instructions. We make it up for ourselves. The source of meaning is us. Right? And then finally, despair. And this is illustrated further by my, um, my friends who did everything right and it still didn't work out for them. We'll likely find ourselves in that situation um, with regard to our careers over the next 20, 30 years. Right? Even if you do everything right, make all of the right moves, that everybody tells you that you're going to be set for life. There are no guarantees. There are absolutely no guarantees, and thus we experience with despair. Right? Start claims that despair has a simple meaning, which is nice, right? It's nice. It means that we shall, page 29, confine ourselves to reckoning only with what depends on our will or on the ensemble of probabilities that make our action possible. When we want something, we always have to reckon with possibilities. I may be counting on the arrival of a friend. The friend is coming by rail or streetcar. This supposes that the train will arrive on schedule or that the streetcar will not jump track. I'm 
left in the realm of possibility. But possibilities are to be reckoned with only to the point where my action comports with the ensemble of these possibilities and no further. Uh, the moment the possibility and uh, the moment the, the possibilities I am considering are not rigorously involved in my action, I have disengaged myself from them because no god, no scheme can ad ad adapt um, the world to its possibilities or, and its possibilities to my will. Right. <clears throat> Effectively, what Sartre is laying out here is. Here's, here's a stupid example. You ever play the computer solitaire game? Or even a game of old-fashioned using card solitaire? You ever make all the right moves and still lose? Sometimes it's not possible to win. Right? And when we realize that we've made all of those right moves and it still didn't work out for us, we experience despair. So, while we are free, we are freedom Sartre argues we're so absolutely free that we even choose to be born. All right? This is how deep our freedom lies. We're free in a world that we didn't choose that doesn't operate according to our will. We don't make the world spin. We don't control the global economic system, we don't control our history, we don't control the economic swings, we don't control the weather, that sort of thing, right? So, we are free in a context we didn't choose and we don't control. We are free, but we have to limit our freedom to what depends on our will. This means that effectively there are no guarantees in life and we can still do everything right and still lose. And I've had enough relationships of this sort, right? That, 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 that you know, it did everything right, it just didn't work out. We didn't have the cards, right? So effectively, our situation is when choosing ourselves, we're choosing all of mankind. Each and every one of our choices define what it means to be human. We're no we don't choose in a vacuum. We don't choose as solipsists. We don't choose just for ourselves. When we make a choice, we are saying that this is what it means to be human and this is what a human being should do. That's the total weight of responsibility that is, in fact, on each and every one of our choices. We can't say, well, I'm sorry, it's policy, or it's I'm just doing what I'm told, and that sort of thing, because effectively, uh, the buck stops with us, right? We have no excuse behind us, nor justification in front of us, right? If we are <laughs> enforcing a policy not our own, we're responsible for enforcing that policy, right? This, this statement of forlornness kind of thing, Hannah Arendt actually does a good job of it, 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 it sort of illustrating this um, it, with regard to Nazis who just enforced Nazi policy, right? The person who swept the floor and led people into the gas chamber was just following policy, right? Does that excuse them of their actions? No, of course not, right? Since we're forlorn, right, we are really responsible in a deep sense for you know, even actions by which we're just following orders. We're never just following orders, we're interpreting orders and we are enacting policy and we are responsible for that enactment. And then this fair, right, effectively we're free in a world that doesn't give a damn about us. Right? So even when we are choosing and giving our actions meaning in this kind of context, sometimes it's just not going to work out. Nobody says that if you follow the rules, everything is just going to be hunky-dory. Right? So this is the situation that we are in. Now, effectively, and I'll just project a little bit forward here, right? what Sartre is going to give us in terms of a treatment of how we make an ethical judgment reflects back on anxiety, forlornness, and despair. Anytime we pretend like our freedom and our responsibility aren't total and deep and intimately connected with one another, anytime we say it's 
not my fault, I had no choice. Right? We're fleeing from our freedom. So, an existentialist gets to point straight us at us and say, bad faith. Bad faith. Effectively, it's kind of, it's not my fault. I had no choice. Well, if existence precedes essence, you always have a choice, and it is always your fault. Right? I'm just following orders. Bull. Buck, buck stops with you. Right? If somebody told you to do it, you still chose to do it. Right? And that somebody you respect, perhaps, told you to do it, but you still have to think for yourself because you are acting and it is still up to you. The buck stops with you. And then, but I did everything right and nothing worked out for me. Well, you're pretending that life is not despair, right? You're pretending like your will shapes the world. Right? No, you are free in a world, but you don't rule the world, you don't control the world, you don't, you know, there are no guarantees in life, right? So, bad faith is going to be the root of the ethical judgment of the existentialist.